Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, I'm Jeff Brazil with the Digital Media and Learning Research Hub based in Southern California at, the, at UC Irvine. And uh, we are um, today embarking on our 10th uh, webinar for Connected Learning. I'm pleased that we have this morning Ellen Mada, who is uh, Research Director of the Civic Engagement Research Group at Mills College in Oakland, California. And Ellen's going to be talking about her work with uh, youth and uh, service and activism in the digital age. Uh, she recently has um, published a paper on this subject, which we'll be referencing today. You can find it in a number of places, including um, www.dmlcentral.net under resources. I read it, and there's a lot of highlighting and underlining in it. It's well worth your time. Um, so the way things work, we'll hear, we'll hear from um, Ellen in a few minutes. We're streaming live on live stream. And we will uh, have a group of people in the Hangout here who will introduce themselves in a moment. And then what we try to do is, is make these sessions interactive. And we take questions and comments and anything from the chat stream on, on live stream. And we'll pull in as many as we can uh, to get to Alan and the, um, our guests in the Hangout. So please be uh, uh, participate and feel free to ask and, and um, put in whatever you'd like. John Barilloni, our community manager is on live stream and he'll be moderating out there and I will be moderating the conversation uh, in, the, in the Google Hangout. Um, we'll start off first with hearing from Ellen and then we'll move, uh, actually I'm sorry, we'll start off first with hearing a brief introduction from each of our Hangout participants and then Ellen will uh, talk to us for a few minutes and we'll, we'll get started from there. So Barry, maybe you can start us off. Sure, am I coming through? Yes. Great. Hi, I'm Barry Joseph. I work at Global Kids here in New York City. Uh, we work with young people in after-school programs throughout the city to develop their identities as global citizens and community leaders. Um, I'm hoping there'll be an opportunity later to share uh, one of the projects that grew out of um, what Ellen's going to be talking about, which is an innovative civic geocaching project. Ben, are you you just joined us? Are you there? <laughs> just made it. Sorry for my lateness. No, uh, that's Perfect timing. Go ahead and, and introduce yourself, Ben. Yeah, my name is Ben Kirshner. I'm a, a professor at the School of Education at CU Boulder, and I do research on youth organizing, youth participatory action research, and uh, how youth, young people use new media in, in those contexts. Carrie? Carrie, you're muted. Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Carrie James. Um, I'm a sociologist um, at uh, Project Zero, which is a research center at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. <clears throat> and um, I do work on young people's digital lives, looking at their sense of ethics online, and more recently uh, looking at the nature of young people's civic and political participation and how digital media is related to that. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate you joining us this morning. So, Ellen, can you uh, start us off? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today was um, how do we apply some of the, what we've learned about participatory culture and connected learning to the, um, and connected learning being the kind of learning we think is enabled by new media and participatory culture. How do we apply what we've learned from that to how we design and support um, civic learning contexts? And in particular, I wanted to talk about this in relation to two long-standing experiential educational practices, service learning and um, youth-led organizing. And I focused on these particular areas because I think they share a lot of the principles of connected learning. Um, and they've also been doing a lot of work over the years to sort of define and understand what supports youth civic engagement. So I think this is an area of productive intersection and collaboration between fields um, and I think there's a lot that the connected learning community can learn from these fields in terms of overcoming some of the challenges of working in different contexts. And I think um, there's a lot that people working in these spaces can learn from the connected learning space about how to use new media to support their practice. So I'm going to switch a little to a screen share here um, just to provide an overview of um, of what these two approaches look like and some of the principles of practice that underlie them and then we'll sort of open it up for discussion. And I just wanted to note today's discussion is really the product of a series of discussions that happened over the course of 
2011 with the Working Group on Service and Activism in the Digital Age. So a number of people really contributed to how we think about this. And um, I'd encourage people, if they're interested in the discussion, to um, have a look at the Working Group paper, the white paper that, we ref that Jeff referenced and that we'll be linking to in the archive. Um, and Ben and Barry were part of this working group, and um, and Ben in particular really influenced sort of the shape of the paper. So just want to give due credit there. Um, okay, so what do we mean by service learning and group organi youth organizing? Um, is my window showing? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. great. Okay. So um, these are two pretty different approaches to supporting youth civic engagement, but they share a lot of overlap in terms of how they approach um, supporting youth civic development. So I'm going to start with some examples. Um, and this first example is Generation On, which is a sort of um, a clearinghouse for service learning. It's a place to organize different projects. And so service learning as an approach is generally defined as a strategy of engaging youth in community service while having them reflect on the knowledge and skills they're using towards that service. Um, this approach has been used within, within the curriculum to teach anything from math to science um, to leadership, but it's also been used in extracurricular spaces as a way to really um, draw young people's attention to thinking critically and carefully about what they're learning from their service and how it's informing their development. Um, so if you just take a quick look here, Generation On's mission is to inspire, equip, and mobilize youth to take action that changes the world and themselves through service. So this is sort of one model of supporting youth civic engagement that's really rooted in the experience of civic engagement. The other approach that we um, wanted to look into was uh, youth-led organizing, and as Ben mentioned, youth organizing is an area he really focuses on. Um, so this example is the Philadelphia Student Union. It's a long-standing uh, youth-led organization, and they do a lot of work um, to address educational opportunity in um, Philadelphia. And what I would say really differentiates the two approaches is that youth-led organizing is really motivated by the action that they're trying to accomplish. So they're trying to improve youth um, circumstances and their power, and the civic learning is done in service of this. So they recognize that in order to address issues that youth face, they need to learn how to organize, how to address, understand policy, how to act civically and politically. Um, I'd also suggest people look into Jerusha Connor's work with Philadelphia Student Union. She's done a lot of work with that group to research and understand their practice. She couldn't be here today, but um, I think she's a great resource for this. So, so these are two sort of approaches that engage youth in action to help support their civic development. And what we as a working group really focused on was what do what are what are these pedagogical approaches trying to accomplish and then how does new media support extend or transform this practice um, and so I just want to highlight sort of four features and I'm going to use more of the generation on example just because their um, website sort of more easily led me to examples um, but these are practices that really happen in both spaces um, so the first practice that I really want to focus people's attention on is that these approaches suggest that supporting youth civic engagement is best accomplished by authentic practice. So engaging youth in the experience of volunteerism and the experience of activism and um, thinking about learning the skills through the actual practice that they're going to have to engage in in the future. And this gives um, a pretty strong counter model to the idea of just sitting there with a textbook learning about the structure and function of government, which is important knowledge, but the idea is that the knowledge is learned in service of understanding how to act. Um, and a note about this, this form of action, the examples that I'm sharing um, typically focus on um, 
engaging in service, engaging in activism, but there's also um, a lot of emphasis on things like role plays and simulations, um, contexts in which youth can practice what it means to engage in a sort of lower risk um, pre-service setting. Um, the second practice, the second sort of principle behind these approaches that I really wanted to focus people's attention on is the idea that um, young people need opportunities to see themselves as part of a community or a social movement. Um, much of the research on youth civic engagement suggests that being part of a larger community or seeing oneself in the context of um, a larger effort towards civic change motivates lifelong civic engagement. So you see here in the generation on example, we are the service generation. So there's a lot of trying to build this sense of you, even if you're doing an individual action, it's towards a larger goal supported by others. Um, other aspects of this are um, thinking about um, working in groups with other youth, uh, maintaining a sort of connection to an organization over time. And these are all aspects that help you see that their work is part of a larger community. Um, so the third principle I wanted to focus on here is the idea that youth are both entitled to and capable of civic action in their own right. So. Um, the idea is we're not preparing them to magically turn 18 and flip a switch and start voting. It's that they have issues that they face currently, um, they have contributions that they can make, and they have a right to share their voice and their perspective. And so I just wanted to sort of highlight here, you see um, youth from an entire sort of age range from 7 to 17 contributing their projects to this shared space. And I also just wanted to call attention to the ways in which digital media is really helping reinforce these practices here in that youth are, because they have a sort of collective space to go to to share their stories, it's framed as this generational effort. It's sort of reinforcing the idea that what they're doing is part of a larger effort. Um, and then the last principle I really wanted to focus on was um, the idea that engaging in civic and political action requires uh, a certain level of grappling with, with issues of justice and fairness. So when you're making public decisions about what to focus on as a group or, um, or how to address issues, it inevitably requires trade-offs, it requires understanding other people's points of view, it requires understanding where you are situated within a broader community. Um, so this is an example from the Philly Student Union blog. They do a lot of analysis of um, social issues as they're thinking about the action that they're taking. So it's not just identifying an issue and figuring out an action to address it, but it's thinking about what are the root causes behind the issue, why are they in particular facing an issue, who in the community is the issue um, most impacting. And so that sort of analysis both helps them think more critically and carefully about the issues that they're facing, but it also helps them target their action more effectively. So this is a lifelong skill that um, supports their, their engagement. Um, so just bringing myself back here. Um, so those are sort of the broad goals of um, and sort of assumptions behind service learning and youth-led organizing. And the question really is, is um, how does what we know about new media either support that practice, change it, um, or pot potentially extend it? So uh, one of the, I'll just give a couple of examples. One example that we've really focused on in terms of community building is the idea that New media does a great job of supporting and sort of extending the practice. So having just a website for your project helps keep the class working together as a community. It provides some continuity. Having a sort of broader map that different individual efforts contribute to extends the community. So it's not just your service project working together, but suddenly you're part of a broader network. Um, and then in terms of transforming, the question is, is there sort of new communities out there that people might be connecting to or engaging with? So 
um, thinking about um, your gaming community or your fan community as a place where you're organizing your efforts or the community that you identify with introduces sort of new considerations. Um, in the space of authentic practice, I think there's a, a lot of room for thinking about how games and simulations can help you sort of get a global understanding of what action looks like and, and what it means to them in a way that um, gives them sort of an entry point into civic action and civic issues and can scaffold their participation. So games like Urge and Evoke um, and Tara Bangs, a previous um, previously existing social network game that has done some of this and I think some of the work that Barry will share can also speak to this issue. Um, and then in terms of social justice and uh, grappling with issues of social justice and fairness, I think this is a particularly a place where um, thinking about new media is interesting. So there's just a lot of new ways of thinking about um, what are rights, what kinds of access are people entitled to, thinking about issues of privacy, access to information, net neutrality are things that are becoming increasingly important public goods that just haven't been in the sphere of, um, of youth um, activism and service learning. Um, and also just thinking about as we're becoming sort of more socially networked, um, what, how do we, how do we maintain sort of healthy, productive communities when not everyone knows each other um, in a sort of physical, face-to-face -face way? Um, so I think that's where I'll hand it over to the group. What I'm really interested in hearing about, um, so each of our members have done a lot of work in the area in different, in supporting different aspects of youth civic development. So I'm really interested in hearing about um, their thoughts on this, the work that they're doing, um, how they see new media um, supporting the practice or challenging it. And then, um, and also I think everyone in this group has dealt with some of the challenges of trying to work this way with youth and, um, and what good practice looks like. So I think we can learn a lot. Ellen, thank you very much. Uh, I want to throw it to the, uh, to the Google Hangout group as well. One of the things that one of the things I loved about your paper was um, there are just so many examples of uh, you know concrete uh, places to go on the web and see where these things are being lived out. So I, I think it's I think it's a great contribution that it makes. So let's throw it to the Google Hangout. If you guys just sort of pass the mic, uh, give us a sense of uh, responding to Alan, but also how your own work and own observations and learnings are are uh, intersecting with that. Start with you, Barry. All right. So, um, <laughs> where, from the way I was seeing it, it was being pointed to someone else, but that's fine. I'm happy to take the mic. Um, so, when Global Kids uh, began participating in the working group, uh, we were tremendously excited. You know, we always we're, we're practitioners, but it's always fun for us to be around academics and and um, and researchers and, and learn from their practices. But we were very uh, challenged to figure out how can we come up with. Um, a potential new project that would support youth civic development uh, through the use of digital media but in new ways and we started noticing um, something called geocaching which uses a number of participatory learning practices that are central to connected learning blended learning geolocative gaming mobile gaming user generated content um, and we were curious you know, how could these DML practices be used to support use civic development. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with geocaching, it's a, kind of essentially a, a global um, scavenger hunt. Uh, there are little op objects like this, little containers that are buried in public places, not buried, hidden in public places by the players that will contain some kind of object or toy like this. We found this in uh, Prospect Park about a month ago in one of them. Uh, and one of the things that you can also find in them are these things. They're called travel bugs. There's a unique number on the back. So it's unique to me, and there's a unique web page for it. And they, have, they come with missions. So whoever puts them in puts in a mission that might say, um, you know, my aunt is in uh, Philadelphia. You know, try and get it to her or uh, want to travel around the world. So we received funds this year from um, the uh, Hive New York City Learning Network to partner with the Brooklyn Public Library to do a civic geocaching project this summer, an intensive two weeks, and we're calling it Race to the White House. 
And so our challenge was to figure out how do we take geocaching, this gaming activity uh, that takes youth out into the community and connects with other people through the web interfaces, and how do we make it a civic engagement process, something to help them not only uh, be connected to public issues, but specifically tied to electoral politics. And we decided that the travel bugs would be the way to do it. And so in brief, uh, what the youth will be doing is looking at issues that they think are important with the upcoming election, that they think the, uh, um, the outcome of the election will have an impact on, and then each of these bugs will be associated with the different issues. So one might be a DREAM Act uh, travel bug. Another one might be education reform. And then the youth will go around New York City placing them in existing geocaches. Uh, maybe we'll do about 50 or 60 of them. And then their mission is to get before the election to the White House, or at least to D.C. And then over the course of the few months, we'll track which ones are moving closer to D.C. and further away. Because the, the, the request to the people who find it is to decide whether or not they think this issue will be affected by the election. If they do, move it closer to a geocache towards D.C. If not, move it away. And then if you choose to, post on the web page for that particular for that particular uh, travel bug, what they think about that issue. So it's a way for people to, to voice their opinion. This is very much challenging the geocaching community. They tend not to get very uh, civically engaged in this way. So we're learning all sorts of things about how to work in this space. Um, and of course, we're also working um, delighted to, with Ellen and uh, Antero Garcia, who will be both evaluating the project, but also helping us to explore how the lessons that she's been sharing today can help inform the project and help us not just do a great project for the young people, but also understand how DML practices can support youth civic development. Thanks, Barry. So when they get to the White House, uh, just have them move in. I think we'll be better off. There you go. <laughs> and the, actually, I mean the Hill, not the White House. Uh, ben, go ahead. You're muted. Back? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I have a couple different ways that I relate to this question, and I will um, – try to just focus on one or two in order to you know, be coherent. But what, one of the ways I want to speak to the intersection between civic activism and <clears throat> new media is from my experience in schools. And I'm involved with a project, I direct a project called Critical Civic Inquiry, which partners with teachers to basically, as part of their classroom uh, work with students, set up project-based learning uh, using participatory action research as the as the main activity around school reform. So there's some overlap with what Barry was talking about and that there's a civic goal of engaging young people in how they want their schools to be improved, what's a problem that they care about. Um, but the, the design is really that as part of their classroom work, they're developing academic skills such as literacy, question asking, data analysis, in order to do research about a problem they experience in their schools and how they can change it. And the goal is definitely promoting a sense of empowerment, leadership, and civic engagement among students who are going to schools that are often struggling schools and, and uh, in, in, in schools that are under-resourced and often doing poorly on the standardized tests, et cetera. So one of the things I've observed right away is, um, is something that might <clears throat> kind of speak to the challenge, maybe a little bit of the pre uh, premise of one of the questions, gently challenge, which is, because um, one of the questions that I was asked to think about is, um, is sort of the availability of these new tools with new me media, and um, and does the availability of digital tools, you know, solve or present problems? And I don't I don't think they're that available yet in schools um, in, in in terms of being integrated into classroom practice. I think that there's a disruptive quality that I think a lot of us are aware of to cell phones and smartphones for students in class, and in that many of the schools that I've worked with. They're generally, you know, not permitted, <clears throat> um, and and I think it's hard, genuinely challenging for teachers to figure out how to leverage smartphones in the classroom. I think actually Barry mentioned Antero Garcia, and he has a nice paper that talks about his, you know, a project he did where students used i i uh, touches um, to uh, i touches or whatever whatever you call them. I don't even know now. i iPod touches. That's what they're called. Um, you know, as part of a curriculum. But I, I think in general, it just it does pose some challenges. So, so what I found, and, and we talked about this a little bit when we were in face-to-face -face meetings working on the white paper, was that unfortunately a lot of the schools, um, perhaps the ones that are least resources, they may have computer labs, but they have a lot of filters on their labs um, in terms of internet filters. So the opportunities to really take advantage of this kind of landscape or this ecology of new media is actually quite difficult. So that's one of the things I've found. Um, and then 
but on, on the other hand, I, I've seen outside of school groups <clears throat> uh, really, you know, really be focusing on new media as a way to organize people and keep people uh, appraised of what they're working on. So I see, I'm seeing increasingly sophisticated websites by youth organizing groups, for example. And Ellen mentioned um, Philadelphia Student Union. And uh, there's a group in Denver that I'm starting to work with called Padres y Jovenes Unidos, Parents and Youth United. And uh, they've got, you know, a really strong social media presence, both on Facebook and uh, email. And uh, if I'm more active on Twitter, I'm sure I'd be getting Twitter updates, but really letting us know what's going on. And, uh, but I see that as a supplement to a kind of the real face-to-face -face organizing work that they do and not a kind of replacement or substitute of. So I think I'll stop there, but one of the questions I'd like to take up maybe a little later in the conversation, um, and it, it gets to um, one of the other questions, so, so I'll, I'll hold up a little bit, but um, I'm, I'm interested in this kind of question of the role, the optimal role of new media in, in as a vehicle for civic engagement, because there's quite a spectrum, I think, from really strong uh, offline groups where they have a history of face-to-face -face work and they can engage in long-term work and then the media can become a kind of extension or vehicle for that versus some sites and I, you know, that are principally an online hub. Um, I don't know, Rock the Vote might be an example of that. Um, that are principally an online hub for people to submit content and kind of learn about things and, 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 and what the differences are in terms of what that, what kinds of civic engagement that fosters. And, and I think that's been a debate a little bit. Uh, my last word is I actually was teaching a seminar this semester and one of my students wrote a paper that kind of took up the debate that uh, Malcolm Gladwell brought up in The New Yorker that I think some of you may be familiar with, kind of wondering whether online activism is substantively, you know, strong and improvement or if it's kind of enables people to be actually less, less active. So that's a conversation that we may come back around to. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Carrie. Yeah. Great, thank you, Ben. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, my screen is frozen. Um, ben, a lot of the things that you mentioned have been high in our minds here. So um, when I gave my introduction, I mentioned that recently we've gotten involved in looking at young people's, from a research perspective, their um, their participation in political and civic contexts and wanting to understand the role of media. Part of uh, MacArthur's Youth and Participatory Politics Research Network. Um, and for our study, we, I'm a qualitative researcher. We do in-depth interviews. And we've been interviewing youth um, mainly in uh, traditional, you know, formally structured political and civic contexts. Um, and, and, you know, we're seeing, when we talk to them about the nature of their work and what they're doing, we're seeing uses of new media, but in the, sort of in the way that Ben uh, described, where they're using media sort of as a megaphone or a microphone to sort of amplify the audience somewhat for their largely offline um, sort of civic and political activities. The offline stuff is still really relevant, really important, face-to-face -face work. Um, in terms of their development as civic actors, the youth development piece, but also the actions that they actually take going out and meeting with folks and, and that remains really important and they sort of put out there, they circulate, you know, news and, um, you know, sometimes videos about what they've done and they use their, sometimes their Twitter accounts and their Facebook groups to reach out to um, people to get them to their events. But it's really sort of online um, facilitation of their offline activities, which is quite different from uh, real digital activism where there's, you know, where the online is the hub, where everything um, is happening and co-presence being together is left less relevant. And you, um, Jennifer Earle, who's a sociologist who works on social movements, has done some really nice work differentiating those different models and trying to see how prevalent they are and, and you know, what kind, how, how media is being used in, in different contexts. So, um, so we, you know, like I said, we've interviewed mainly youth involved in more traditional organizations. One example is uh, Mikva Challenge, which is a Chicago-based organization that gets low-income youth 
um, involved in the political process. It's a wonderful, um, wonderful, you know, well-known and acclaimed organization um, that gives you the skills and the tools. Um, and it's heavily adult facilitated, but it really gives youth a lot of agency in carrying out actions that affect policy. And it, you know, it, it's been around for a long time. It looks like a very traditional organization. They're using their Facebook group, and actually, they have a Twitter uh, account that they I've noticed that they don't really use it all that much. But they use their Facebook group to sort of advertise that a lot of the things that they're doing offline, and a lot of those things involve campaign work interfacing directly with electoral politics. Um, and these youth have a really, really incredible uh, sense of agency and efficacy and, uh, you know, in many ways I was blown away by them. Um, and I'll contrast that with some of, we, we also recently interviewed some Boston Occupy activists um, and that, you know, there we saw something quite different going on, especially with respect to use of media. I mean, media has played such an important role in the Occupy movement, um, and in Boston, it's just, you know, you know, there is a camp, of course, um, there's a lot that happens offline, but nearly everything that happens is documented, um, and it's uh, shared online and circulated, and, and, the, and the web is used to connect Occupy movements across the country, so we see that media there is playing a really um, impressive, um, a really um, core role in what they're doing, and but I'm mindful of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's comment that you know there are these powerful social movements in the '60s, um, and cert I mean and they were transformative on a national, if not a global scale, um, without the use of these media. So um, you know we can't say that Occupy couldn't happen without the media, but we're definitely seeing that media, the uptake of media, and the uses are quite different from what we've seen anyway in these more traditional youth organizations. Alan, go ahead. I think you had something you wanted to, to build on there. Yeah, I just, I, one, I wanted to thank you all for your thoughts, but I also wanted to respond to this question of just what is the role of new media in cases where there is either sort of challenges of access or, you know, if people are, are engaging in effective practice already, sort of what's the point? Um, at least that's how I heard that question, um, and, and it's something I grapple with. And the issue of access, I think, is an important one. Um, we're dealing with that with an initiative we have going on in OUSD, Oakland Unified School District, right now, um, a digital civic literacy initiative. And the access is incredibly uneven, and filters are an issue. Um, but I guess I'd just like to point to that as being an area to work on as much as it is an obstacle, I think, um, given how much of our our online, uh, of our polit political life is going online, I think not having access to these tools and not being able to integrate them into how youth are learning is, um, is actually an issue of justice and access. Um, so the question is sort of how do you work with teachers and districts to think creatively about filters, about how to, um, how to connect cell phones. I mean, currently the youth that we've been interviewing in um, in the number of low income areas talk about the use of cell phones for writing papers because they don't have reliable internet access at home. So they are using mobile um, in a lot of ways and the question is how do you build those bridges? And the other thought is just um, for these long-standing groups who are using digital media to sort of support their practice, I think the question is how, how can they use it sort of more effectively and more creatively to extend what they're doing. So it's not to supplant the face-to-face -face organizing as much as it is how does it serve as a way to more effectively frame their messages, to reach a broader audience, to maintain their community in ways that um, you know, when they don't have the option of the face-to-face -face context, when they've started to move away or move on from their organization. So Jerusha, in her work with uh, Philly Student Union, has started to notice how um, the Facebook page is sort of keeping their alumni engaged in ways that they weren't engaged before. So it sort of extends that community, um, I think, in some important ways. So I think that that was just, those were just my initial reactions that I know we want to open it up for. Yeah, questions. thanks, Alan. I want to bring in a question from the, the live stream, and this, I'll throw this out to any of the of, of you guys in the Hangout. 
the, the gist of the question is how do we bridge or how do we reach out um, to the service learning sector with the digital activist sector and the presumption of the question is that <clears throat> it's not necessarily that's not necessarily happening right now so how would you sort of um, get those groups together who wants to tackle it one thing I can add is um, the National Service Learning Conference that, that meets every year, which brings together about 2,000 young people and about 1,000 adults. Uh, Global Kids uh, had a presence there about over the last four years doing just this kind of work, talking about how digital media can be used uh, for civic engagement. And whenever we, we talk with, whether it's the young people directly or the educators, it's tremendous excitement. So I think doing whatever we can to keep uh, bridging the gap between the communities, finding these opportunities where uh, service learning professionals are getting together and, and bringing, in, bringing in these ideas and, and teaching people these practices, which is true for, I think, any community when you talk about how do you develop people's capacity for using digital media to enhance their work uh, and, and achieve the things you can do with digital media. This is one particular community we need to do <coughs> an outreach. Uh, go ahead. Well, I also hear two, two possible issues with the question or kind of dimensions of the question. <clears throat> That's my academic uh, side of me speaking, but um, w one aspect of the question is just how digital media in more effective ways. The other is, I'm not sure if the question is also saying like, how do we bring a kind of activist social justice discourse to service learning, uh, which is, you know, Ellen spoke to the idea of having justice and rights, et cetera, be a kind of important part of the agenda. So I, I that would be a different kind of question, a different kind of issue that's less of, that that would complement what Barry's saying. But I think it's more about arguments about what you know, what kind of what forms of civic engagement are we trying to encourage? And I don't know if the person who sent that message in wants to speak to that or clarify at all which aspect of it is most important. And I'll just chime in um, and say that I think that the you know in in terms of innovative uses of media and highlighting that to maybe more traditional service learning groups. I think the work of um, Henry Jenkins um, and Sangeeta, um, and I can't remember her last name, um, who works with Henry, yes, thank you, who works uh, with Henry at USC to really document some of these, um, they call them participatory civics cultures. Um, that are, you know, doing, you know, really amazing work, many of them with <coughs> social justice issues um, and using media um, in order to organize themselves and in innovative ways to get um, their work out there and they're, you know, youth driven and really interesting. I think that highlighting some of those exemplars um, to um, youth working in more traditional contexts and to the adults who mentor and facilitate them in those contexts is an, an important and ex maybe Barry's example of doing that at conferences is one way but sort of um, getting the stories out there um, so that uh, youth in traditional contexts can learn from them. Um, I'll just piggyback on that so I'm going to tackle the half <laughs> of uh, Ben's clarification that talks about how do you um, make the translation from digital to service. Uh, making service learning more activist is a sort of long-standing separate issue, <laughs> which I'm sure we're both familiar with. Um, so, and I, I, I agree with Carrie that these examples from the field are important, but um, I guess I would push it a little further and say I think translational work needs to be done um, because the the participatory cultures that happen spontaneously through fan activism or um, through sort of youth motivation alone are um, pretty different than translating to the classroom setting. So I think there's some just translational work to do, translational work to do to sort of articulate these practices in the language of service learning. And so that was part of the point, I think, of some of what we did in the white paper was to say, okay, here's what you're trying to accomplish through service learning. Here's how digital media supports that. Here are some of the practices that we've seen in other settings. Here's how it might be incorporated into your setting. And I think some of that work needs to be done. And I, I think uh, Global Kids is doing some of that work by going to the conferences and that kind of thing. But I think, you know, there's just a sort of constant need to engage um, with these other settings. On this same subject, there's a comment on the live stream that uh, fr from a person that says that the 
the university service learning centers that they work with don't allow youth to do digital social projects. So there's, I guess, there's a tension there. Can can you guys address that? Maybe that's uh, maybe that's one of Ben's points. I'm surprised to hear that at the university level. Um, ben, did you? Were you going to say something, or I, I, I'd be curious what the rationale is at the high school level? I, that doesn't surprise me. Um. Let's move to. Uh, let's return to the uh, the Gladwell issue, if we could. That, that that Ben had referenced. I mean, from a broad audience perspective, that you know that essay and that whole notion of you know sl you know clicktivism and all of that is uh, is an issue that sort of overlays this. So uh, I don't know, if Ben, you want to dive in first, or Alan? Sure. But let's return to that. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, one way that I might think about it is throwing out a contrast, and I, I, I'm not, um, I'm actually not going to try and say one is superior than the other, but I want to give two examples of, of, of ways that media are used to promote civic engagement and activism. So example number one that I'm guessing a lot of us, you know, everyone listening and is familiar with is, is Trayvon Martin, and there's been, uh, you know, some interesting journalism about the role of social media in kind of fostering people's engagement and understanding of that case in Florida. Um, and, and it certainly really, I think social media, it sounds like, did play a really pivotal role in making that a national story of, of, of uh, and, and it started to take on this, you know, political dimensions, both in terms of r racism and people talking about racism, the whole, you know, imagery of the hoodie uh, becoming a really something that traveled around the country and, and, and I'm guessing around the world as a kind of powerful image of solidarity. And then also, you know, to a certain extent, I think bubbling up, you know, in the weeks that followed is, is some attention to ALEC, the legislative uh, group that, that, that promoted the Stand Your Ground law that, that really was part of the story there in Florida. So I guess what I'm trying to say is um, it really fostered a lot of, of both kind of information sharing and different forms of symbolic activism around that issue, um, which I think was powerful and it certainly had an impact in the world. But I would, it was very much generated by a kind of something that happened spontaneously and you it might turn out to be a very much of a kind of single issue event. And if, and if I contrast that with, um, let's say, a, you know, a campaign that a group like Padres, Padres Unidos in Colorado is doing, where I remember like probably three years ago, they were starting to talk about the, the issue of the school to jail track and how too many kids were getting, you know, misdemeanors essentially for nonviolent offenses in school, like truancy or showing up late or maybe having marijuana, and that those misdemeanors were contributing to a record that was ultimately landing them in jail as 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds. That's what the school to jail track is. Um, and really wanting to start with no real public media around that issue in Colorado and, and generate interest in it. And it's been a multi-year project. They started out by getting some newspaper articles. They got some prominent DAs, district attorneys in Colorado, uh, including Boulder, to basically speak out against the practice of giving um, tickets and misdemeanors for nonviolent offenses for young people. And uh, but it really like there was some real kind of labor, blood, sweat, and tears get went into making people aware of that issue. Versus uh, there was no kind of real high-profile event that happened. Is I guess what I'm trying to say. And now, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, the legislature, which is actually the House part of the legislature, which is, has a sm slight Republican majority, voted unanimously to end this practice of ticketing youth for, for uh, nonviolent offenses. And it's now, you know, become a state law that schools have to abide by. And uh, there's more of a restorative justice kind of component. So, uh, so I'm not sort of saying one is better necessarily. They're really different issues. But I want to put it out there that it could be, and this, this is an area that I think, you know, I want to read more and, and more research can be done, that, that the Trayvon Martin case is sort of like this flame that goes up and then, you know, and gets people aware, but then also dies out and there's not kind of long-term work. For example, it'd be interesting to see a year from now or two years from now if there is, if there continues to be work around this stand your ground law or if, or if it goes away, you know, versus a long-term sustained campaign that almost has to generate interest and, and manufacture interest in order to get past. And, and, and those are two different kinds of civic activism. And they make use of online media in different ways. Um, because certainly the, the, the school to jail track campaign used media. You know, I, I went to one meeting and then I'll be quiet. 
But I went to one meeting where part of the expectation of the meeting was that you had to, or you didn't have to, but they asked people to do a short video. They, they asked people to video, videotape telling a story of a time they broke the law as minors and what happened to them. And almost all the stories are like, oh yeah, I vandalized this thing and I got a, you know, they made me do X, but I didn't get like a ticket. I didn't go to jail for it. And they were trying to tell a story about a generational shift, that things that we did that were wrong when we were 13, 14, 15, used to just be kind of like, we'd get some consequences, but, you know, we didn't have a record because of it. And those videos, you know, became really big, important part of their campaign. They, there was a different video for every day of this hundred days of storytelling. So they use new media and they put them on the web, but it, it's a different kind of case. So, so I'll stop there and let my distinguished panelists maybe make sense of those two examples. No, those are great examples. And it's, it's, it's something we're seeing unfolding on a, on a daily, weekly basis. So thanks, Ben. Yeah. I want to throw, uh, change a little bit of the, of the direction. In, in, the, in your paper, Alan, you uh, re reference or flag an issue of sort of the quality of, of online community and, and right. online engagement for youth. And I wanted to know, I wanted to actually, this seems to intersect a lot with Carrie's work. And I was interested mm -hmm. to hear that. But, in, but, but Carrie, I don't know if you had um, thoughts on that, but just sort of this whole issue of the quality of online community, what kids need, what youth need mm -hmm. uh, for support in that area. Um, yeah, in our group, we're really interested in this question of um, mentorship and supports um, for youth to engage um, as civic actors, as political actors, but also as just more generally responsible citizens online, even if they're not in a formal civic or political context. So, um, and that's part of the ethics work that we've been doing. So, um, you know, we see in looking, like I mentioned, an organization like MICFA, um, that's a more traditional organization, uh, we see really, um, really well-structured and well-thought-out um, mentoring and support for young people's participation in that sphere. Um, and then, uh, you know, and I'm curious about, we, we're not looking at the same kinds of groups that um, Henry Jenkins is looking at, the participatory civics groups where they're online as sort of the hub of everything they're doing. They come from fan cultures that are forged online. Um, I, I'm not doing that work, but I, but I have questions about the role of mentoring and role modeling um, for participation that's unfolding in those contexts, how it happens, because it seems much more organic. And um, the closest I can get is, you know, I mentioned the work we did studying some young people involved in Occupy, and we saw a really different sort of uh, role modeling support experience that it was it was more like a learning by doing context and I think that's an important feature of um, the practices that Ellen um, had pointed to in her paper it's a learning by doing context and and the um, the mentoring and the support it's more informal um, and it it can be equally powerful um, but also the, some of the young people talked about you know moments of stress where they felt like well, I'm just being thrown into this situation where I have to mediate a conflict between uh, this activist and a police officer because um, you know this is this is one thing I do as part of this Occupy community and and the effects um, um, are important for their civic learning um, but we did hear somewhat of a longing for um, something that might have been a little bit more structured so I you know I really have questions about and I think there's a lot that um, that maybe online participatory cultures can learn from um, role modeling and supports that occur offline but also vice versa I really want to know more about what's happening in those other contexts and that might, could be the wave of the future for some of young people's civic work. Mm -hmm. um, Carrie, oh yeah, okay. Carrie, can I follow up? Um, just in terms of, because a lot of what you're talking about is in the two spaces, but in terms, I think your group has done some thinking about um, just what youth need to sort of grapple with or um, think about when they're building their online communities so either with people that they know from their face-to-face -face community or just general online community um, so I think there's so much in the news around cyberbullying and that kind of thing and everyone's sort of aware that any given comment thread involves some pretty hostile language and so um, so I think there's a question just around how do you build both civil but also sort of deep meaningful sustained community online when it's easy to just sort of dip in and out or, um, you know, just maintain a sort of casual 
connection, which is fine, but it's not the same thing. Yeah, for sure. I think I mean we've we've done this this work on digital citizenship, and we're really interested in and in how people, young people, not just you know in civic and political work, but just in their social or friendship-driven activities, how they think about the fact that they're operating in a network public and what responsibilities are um, implied by that. Um, and I think that you know your reference, you know, we're, you know, as part of the political work, we're really interested in dialogue online and the nature of, of discourse online, whether it's about political issues or just about, you know, you know, fun stuff like celebrity gossip. How are people engaging with one another and are they doing it in a respectful way? And there are far too many uncivil models out there. You open up any, you know, online news item and you look at the comment thread and inevitably it breaks down into really um, disrespectful, uncivil exchanges and you know I worry about the lack of good models for those sorts of exchanges online not just about civic and political things but just in general where where are really good um, dialogues happening and, and how can young people sort of get in the way of that and I think that um, that's something that that needs to be thought out, thought about and I think I, I wonder if Barry has some thoughts yeah, um, I really appreciate what you're talking about around youth developing the civic discourse uh, through online spaces. One of the things that we're going to be adding to the, the geocaching project is a tie-in with our, our digital badging uh, system that's being developed here in New York City as part of Global Kids, but also the, the broader Hive Learning Network. And, and yesterday we were trying to figure out what are some of the key learning objectives um, for the youth in the geocaching program that could be badged or badgeified that are very discrete areas of learning. And we started noticing all the different ways they're going to be writing. Um, when you have, uh, when you find a geocache, you can go to the website for, for that particular cache and put up comments, something that appreciates that cache or critiques it if you had a hard time finding it. So we, we saw that could be an opportunity for youth to start developing not just writing but online writing skills because of what online spaces offer for them to both have an opportunity to give feedback but do it in a way that's different than when they're in person. It's not totally anonymous, it's semi-anonymous, but it's not totally with their face as well. So how do we teach them how to negotiate their identities in that space and what's appropriate to say or not appropriate. So I think what you're saying is a, is a, a, a fabulous opportunity for us to be thinking about. Barry, qu a quick question for you. I mean, you work so closely with uh, the youth and one of the questions that's posed in, or that it's examined in, in Ellen's work is this notion that, you know, youth are disengaged from civic and politics historically. Is digital, does the digital, uh, does digital media and that domain make kids more engaged and the secondarily, are they able to have have an effect? What what's sort of your take on, on on those two questions? Are they more engaged? Does it engage them? Does it draw them? And their ability to actually have effect. Well, I think going back to the, the beginning of what Ellen introduced, I think one of the the last things she mentioned was this very notion that youth are are, are interested in civic issues. Global Kids is just over about twenty two years old at this point, and from the beginning of our history, uh, talking with people about why we thought it was important for to, to understand global issues, there was always a sense of, well, they just don't care, and why should they? They have other issues that they need to be dealing with. Our, our presumption from a youth development perspective is that, of course, youth care about these things. It's just teaching them in a way that will engage them and have them make a personal connection with these larger conceptual and global issues. So digital media offers just one of many ways to speak to young people, to engage them where their interests actually are. Um, if youth are interested in performance, you can use performance as a way to engage them. If they're interested in activism, then being involved with an act advocacy project can do that and so digital media just offers yet another uh, window in if they love games you can use games as a way to engage young people and have them designing games around social issues geocaching just being one of the many examples so digital media creates just another way to make very obvious these are things that youth are interested in and then how do we take what they're doing in their informal spaces and try and build scaffolding around it in an informal learning environment so we can then not only support them to pursue their own interests but then connect them uh, to civic issues in a way that that can make them make a personal connection that they can then choose to pursue on their own. And that second part of what you asked about is so, so what can they do with that? So being able to work with youth where they're already using digital media might uh, give them tools and abilities to do things that they couldn't otherwise do um, without that kind of scaffolded support that, that and the mentoring that Carrie was talking about. So for example, we might work with young people who really love gaming and working with them can help them understand how gaming can have a social impact and through that, that awareness can then filter back to their activities through not just the game itself but the gaming communities on the fan, fan boards, on the, where people write walkthroughs around gaming, they can then bring that social consciousness back into that space and pursue the issues 
that they care about that previously they thought were, were divided from their gaming space. Here's the issues I care about in the world. Here's my gaming space. And in working with them, they can see how they can combine the two. Great. Thank you. We have about five minutes left, and so we're going to loop back to, I think, the two examples that Ben had brought up. And, Ellen, I think you had a, a comment. Yeah, um, just because I think it's really important, and I wanted to highlight two things. Um, so one, issues like the Trayvon Martin case, um, these sort of uh, flare-ups of, of issues, I think, are now part of our landscape of civic life and activism. And so just learning how to understand and engage with those, I think, is becoming a civic skill. Um, so um, I think these examples are, are pretty complex. For example, the Invisible Children and uh, Coney 2012 campaign. I felt like every day the news sort of swayed one way or the other about whether that was good or bad or whether it was going to have an impact. And it's just, and it still continues to unfold. And so it's been a sort of interesting thing to see. And Henry Jenkins's group has done some really great blogging on the topic just to try to unpack specifically in response to the slacktivism idea as well. So, um, so I really encourage people to look at some of that coverage because I think they do a great job of capturing some of the nuance of that. Um, and then the other point I just wanted to make was this is a way to get the attention potentially of some people who may not be already inclined to engage with the group. And so, but I think it's an open question of how do you translate that flash in the pan interest into longer term, more organized action. Um, and I just think that's an area where there's a lot more work to be done. Um, so. I might want to say one thing too, if I could. Um, I just want to come back to the the, the issue that that that, I, that a couple of us were speaking about too, in terms of young people in schools um, and kind of the opportunities in classrooms and schools, and mm -hmm. just say that <clears throat> new media and and I think Barry and Carrie, I'm guessing you might agree with this too, but you know, there's a quality as you were talking about with the mentors and the scaffolding. There's obviously differences in quality of how we use these different tools, and I had mentioned just that that some of the you know smartphones et cetera in certain contexts can seem disruptive to teachers, but I actually think that it's what's more important is also to attend to the ways that participatory learning in general can be disruptive in a lot of schools, and so um, doing participatory research where you care about the knowledge that kids have and um, it, it, it is is just as disruptive. So I, I think there's a kind of whole suite of practices that are that are a, po a good kind of disruptive, right. um, and it's not the tools themselves. It's not just the media part of the part of it. I'll stop there. Great. We're getting close to the top of the hour. We like to respect uh, uh, the yeah. everyone's calendars. Did anyone have a final comment on this? On this topic. <laughs> I guess I would just like to reinforce the idea that what we really are talking about are practices and not tools. And so the question is, I think, you know, that's very core to DML's thinking about the role of technology and it's sort of how does technology and the culture that emerges around it support certain kinds of practices. Um, throwing a whole suite of iPads at a school is probably not going to achieve what we're hoping to see in terms of approaches to learning. And combining the last two things that, that Karen and Ben said, it is about practices and it is about using these tools to disrupt practices and do them in a way that can actually integrate them into what people are doing to teach them new ways of thinking about things, but do it in a way that actually allows them to be fully engaged with the process and not overwhelmed by it. That's a balancing act that everyone needs to work out for themselves and for their own institution, but unless we look at the tools as being disruptive towards practices, the tools themselves aren't actually going to change the way we're actually t able to support youth to be civically engaged. Carrie? Sorry, Carrie? Unmuting, uh, unmuting myself. Um, no, I, I'm just going to uh, join the choir here and say that it really is about the practices and we're, you know, we've been really interested as part of the YPP network in particular practices that young people are engaged in, things like production now that like the barriers to using media are much lower. How do they take up those practices and how do they use them to um, for voice and agency and, and think about their responsibilities when they put um, their content out in network public. So, um, and I want to just say thanks for, um, you know, inviting me to take part in this really rich conversation. 
Thank you, thank you all. Uh, it's the top of the hour, and we're gonna we'll, we'll close out here shortly. One thing that Ellen brought up in the paper, which is a great action item for somebody out in the uh, in, in in the sphere, is we need a clearinghouse. There's so many great activities and great programs, but they're sort of all over the place. And so uh, maybe we'll take that up in another session. But uh, it was a, it was a great idea. Thank you, Barry and Ben, Carrie and Ellen, for this morning. Really appreciate the conversation. It's very timely. Uh, you know, it's unfolding every day and every week. A full recording of this session is will be available on um, www.connectedlearning.tv later today, and you can continue to you can continue continue to comment, uh, add questions, add links, add resources on the stream there right below the session that has Ellen's name in big bold letters. And, um, and so please continue doing that. And then we have another session on Tuesday. Our next session is Tuesday the 22nd. It's with uh, Craig Watkins from the University of Texas who's doing some great work on social equity and digital media, the impact of, of digital uh, media and the internet on equity issues. And uh, Craig will join us at 9 to 10 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesday. Uh, and we'd love to have any and all of you back for that. Tell your friends, tell your networks. And thanks for showing up and being part of this. Everybody have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.